Danny, the champion of the world. When I was four months old, my mother died suddenly and my father was left to look after me all by himself. I had no brothers or sisters. So all through my boyhood, from the age of four months onward, there were just the two of us, my father and me. We lived in an old gypsy caravan behind a filling station. My father owned the filling station and the caravan and a small field behind, but that was about all he owned in the world. It was a very small filling station on a country road surrounded by fields and woody hills. There was a wooden shed behind the pumps that served as an office. There was nothing in the office except an old table and a cash register to put the money into. It was one of those where you pressed a button and a bell rang and a drawer shot out with a terrific bang. I was a scruffy little boy with grease and oil all over me, but that was because I spent all day in the workshop helping my father serving customers with petrol and repairing car engines. The square brick building to the right of the office was the workshop. My father built that himself with loving care and it was the only really solid thing in the place. Pass me that spanner there, lad. Here you are. Ta. Now then, let me see. Uh -huh. Hooray! <laughs> You're a genius, Dad. Oh, genius, oh, I don't think. But you, Danny, you must be easily the best young mechanic in the world. Really? Oh, yeah, I mean it. You like this work, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> All this messing around with engines. I love it. I want to teach you to be a great mechanic. And when you grow up, I hope you'll become a famous designing engineer. A man who designs new and better engines for cars and aeroplanes. Oh, Dad. Yeah. Well, for that... You'll need a really good education. School? Well, not just yet, no. <laughs> In another two years, you'll have learned enough here with me to be able to take a small engine completely to pieces and put it together again all by yourself. Cool. Yeah. And after that, you can go to school. Now, let's get the workshop tidied up, ready for tomorrow. We can't do good work in a rotten workshop now, can we? No, Dad. No. Then we can get ourselves home for our tea. Home was the old gypsy caravan, a real old wagon with fine patterns painted all over it in yellow and red and blue. The wooden spokes in the big wheels were beginning to rot, so my father had propped it up underneath with bricks. At least 150 years old this caravan is, you know. Wow. Yeah. Now just imagine how many gypsy children have been born in here and grown up within these wooden walls. They must have wandered for thousands of miles along the roads and lanes of England with an old horse pulling it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, come on, drink that tea up. I'll put the kettle on for your bath. Oh, Dad! Oh, well, you can't go to bed looking like that. Whenever I needed a bath, my father would heat a kettle of water and pour it into a basin. Then he would strip me naked and scrub me all over, standing up. This, I think, got me just as clean as if I were washed in a bath. Probably cleaner because I didn't finish up sitting in my own dirty water. Then he used to tuck me up in my bunk and tell me stories. Not only was my father, without the slightest doubt, the most marvellous and exciting father any boy ever had, he was also the best storyteller in the world. What's it to be tonight, then? The big friendly giant. Oh, our friend the BFG again. All oh, right, you are. Well, the BFG is three times as tall as an ordinary man, and his hands are as big as... as what? As wheelbarrows. Oh, yes. Now, he lives in a vast underground cavern not far from our filling station, and he only comes out when it's dark. Inside the cavern, he has... A powder factory. A powder factory. Where he makes magic powders. Hundreds of different ones. <laughs> You've remembered. Of course I have. Dad? Yeah? 
Can you sit right here, Dad, on the edge of my bunk? Can do. <sighs> now then, the big friendly giant makes his magic powders out of the dreams that children dream when they're asleep. How? Ah, oh, dreams, my love, are very mysterious things. They float around in the night air like little clouds, searching for sleeping people. Can you see them? Oh, nobody can see them. Then how does the BFG catch them? Ah, that is the interesting part. A dream, you see, as it goes drifting through the night air, makes a tiny little buzzing humming sound. A sound so soft and low it's impossible for ordinary people to hear it. But the BFG can hear it easily. His sense of hearing is absolutely fantastic. What happens when he catches the dreams? Oh, well, then he imprisons them in glass bottles and screws the tops down tight. He has thousands of these bottles in his cave. Does he catch bad dreams as well as good ones? Yes, he catches both. But he only uses the good ones in his powders. The bad ones... What does he do with the bad ones? He explodes them. <gasps> as for the good ones, well, he goes prowling through the villages searching for houses where children are asleep. <gasps> No, 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 he's not frightening. But because of his great height, he can reach windows that are one and even two flights up. And when he finds a room with a sleeping child, he opens his suitcase. His suitcase? Oh, yeah. He keeps all his powders in his suitcase. Then he takes out his blowpipe, which is as long as a lamppost. And then he selects exactly the right powder, puts it in his blowpipe, and slides the blowpipe in through the open window. And then, poof, he blows in the powder and the powder floats about the room and the child breathes it in. And then what? And then, Danny, the child begins to dream a marvellous and fantastic dream. And when the dream reaches its most marvellous and fantastic moment, then the magic powder really takes over. And suddenly the dream is not a dream any longer, but a real happening. Really? Yeah. And the child is not asleep in bed. He is fully awakened. It's actually in the place of the dream and is taking part in the whole thing. Wow. <sighs> right, more of the BFG tomorrow then. Oh. Oh, no, come on now. Turn down your lamp, son. It's time to sleep. Dad. What is it? Have you ever actually seen the BFG? Once. Only once. You did? Where? I was out behind the caravan, and it was a clear moonlit night, and I happened to look up, and suddenly I saw this tremendous tall person running along the crest of the hill. You didn't? Huh. He had a queer, long, striding, lolloping gait, and his black cloak was streaming out behind him like the wings of a bird. No! Yeah. There was a big suitcase in one hand and a blowpipe in the other. And when he came to the high hawthorn hedge at the end of the field, he just strode over it wow. as though it wasn't there. Were you frightened, Dad? No. It was thrilling to see him and uh, a little eerie, but I wasn't frightened. Now go to sleep now. Good night. <laughs> Two years went by, and at the age of seven, believe it or not, I really could take a small engine to pieces and put it together again. The time had come to start school. So the world I lived in consisted of the filling station, the workshop, the caravan, the school, which was two miles away in the nearest village, and of course the woods and fields and streams in the countryside around. I was never bored. There's a good wind today, Danny. Just right for flying a kite. Let's make a kite. It was impossible to be bored in my father's company. Plots and plans and new ideas came flying off him like sparks from a grindstone. Not only did we make and fly kites, but one day we even made a fire balloon out of paper and glue with a ball of cotton wool tied in the bottom. It was getting dark when we carried it outside into the field behind the caravan. 
We had with us a bottle of methylated spirit and some matches. I held the balloon upright while my father crouched underneath it and carefully poured a little meths onto the ball of cotton wool and struck a match. Here goes. Hold the sides out as much as you can, Danny. Wow, look at that flame. It'll catch on fire. No, no, it won't. Now, hold the sides out as much as you can and watch. Now, see? The balloon's filling with hot air. Oh, yes. Yeah, she's nearly ready. I can feel her floating. Shall we let her go? No, not yet. Wait till she's tugging to fly away. She's tugging now. Right, let her go. It flies! Oh, it's a beauty! It's like a magic fireball. Will other people see it? Oh, I'm sure they will, Danny. It's high enough now for them to see it for miles around. They'll probably think it's a flying saucer. Will they call the police? Probably. Oh, she's coming down now. Look, the flame's nearly gone out. We lost sight of the balloon when the flame went out, but we guessed roughly which field it would be landing in, and we climbed over a gate and ran towards the place. For half an hour we searched the field in the darkness, but we couldn't find our balloon. I found it the next morning, though, lying in the corner of a field that was full of black and white cows. So I carried it home and hung it alongside the kite, against a wall in the workshop, for another day. No, life was never dull with my father. After the balloon came the treehouse up in the top of the big oak at the bottom of our field. Then the bow and arrow, and stilts that made me ten feet tall, and a boomerang that came back and fell at my feet nearly every time I threw it. And for my last birthday there'd been something that was more fun perhaps than all the rest. An amazing machine made from four bicycle wheels and several large soap boxes. But this was no ordinary whizzer. It had a brake pedal, a steering wheel, a comfortable seat and a strong front bumper to take the shock of a crash. I called it Sopo, and just about every day I would take it up to the top of the hill in the field and come shooting down again at incredible speeds. So you can see that being eight years old and living with my father was a lot of fun. But I was impatient to be nine. I reckoned that being nine would be even more fun than being eight. As it turned out, I was not altogether right about this. My ninth year was certainly more exciting than any of the others, but not all of it was exactly what you would call fun. What I learned at the age of nine is that no father is perfect. Grown-ups are complicated creatures full of quirks and secrets. Some have quirkier quirks and deeper secrets than others, but all of them, including one's own parents, have two or three private habits hidden up their sleeves that would probably make you gasp if you knew about them. It was one Saturday night that I learned about my father's most private and secret habit a habit that was to lead us both into some very strange adventures indeed. I woke in the night. I lay still, listening for the sound of my father's breathing in the bunk above mine. I could hear nothing. He wasn't there. Well, this meant that he'd gone back to the workshop to finish a job. He often did that after he tucked me in. I listened for the usual workshop sounds the little clinking noises of metal against metal or the tap of a hammer. But no sound came from the workshop. I got out of my bunk and found a box of matches by the sink. I struck a match and held it up to the funny old clock that hung on the wall above the kettle. It said, ten past eleven. I went to the door of the caravan. Dad? Dad, are you there? Dad? Dad, where are you? Where are you? I went down the caravan steps and crossed over to the workshop. I switched on the light. The old car we'd been working on through the day was still there, but not my father. 
I took the torch from the bench in the workshop and went into the office. Not there. Then I ran down the field to the lavatory. It was empty. Dad! Dad! Please come home! Where are you? Back inside the caravan, I shone the torch into his bunk, but he wasn't there. He wasn't in his bunk. For the first time in my life, I felt a touch of panic. I put my blanket round my shoulders and sat on the doorstep of the caravan with my feet on the top step of the ladder. There was a new moon in the sky, and across the road the big field lay pale and deserted in the moonlight. The silence was deadly. Then at last, from far away, I heard the faint tap-tap of footsteps on the road, and out of the mist a figure appeared. Dad! Dad! Danny! What on earth's the matter? I thought something awful had happened to you. No, no. <laughs> oh, come on. Let's get you back inside and into bed. Oh. I'm sorry. I should never have done it, but you don't usually wake up, do you? Where did you go? Yeah, yeah. Come on. You must be tired out. I'm not a bit tired. Couldn't we light the lamp for a little while? Of course. There. Now, how about a hot drink? Yes, please. I'll put the kettle on. I've decided something. What? I'm going to let you in on the deepest, darkest secret of my whole life. A secret? Yeah. Now, you asked me where I'd been. The truth is, I was up in Hazel's Wood. But that's miles away. Six miles and a half. But, Dad, I yeah, wanted... Yeah, I know I shouldn't have gone, and I'm very, very sorry about it. But I had such a powerful yearning. Why? Why would you want to go all the way up to Hazel's Wood? Do you know what is meant by poaching? Poaching? Not really, no. It means going up into the woods in the dead of night and coming back with something for the pot. Poachers in other places poach all sorts of different things. But around here... It's always pheasants. You mean stealing them? Oh, well, we don't look at it that way. Poaching is an art. A great poacher is a great artist. Is that actually what you were doing in Hazel's Wood, Dad? Poaching pheasants? I was practising the art. The art of poaching. <gasps> now, I, I, I know what you're thinking, Danny. You're thinking, how could my dad go creeping around in the woods at night, pinching valuable birds belonging to somebody else? The kettle's boiling. Oh, so it is. See, your granddad, my own dad, was a magnificent and splendiferous poacher. He taught me all about it, see? I caught the poaching fever from him when I was ten years old, and I've never lost it since. I knew in those days just about every man in our village was out in the woods at night poaching pheasants. And they did it not only because they loved the sport, but because they needed food for their families. Here, get this cocoa down here. Thanks, Dad. See, when I was a boy, Danny, times were bad for a lot of people in England. Some families were literally starving. Yet a few miles away in the rich man's wood, thousands of pheasants were being fed like kings twice a day. So can you blame my dad for going out occasionally and coming home with a bird or two for the family to eat? No, of course not. But we're not starving here, Dad. Ah, <laughs> You've missed the point, Danny boy. You've missed the whole point. Poaching is such a fabulous and exciting sport that once you start doing it, it gets into your blood and you, you can't give it up. And just imagine, just imagine for a minute that you are all alone up there in the dark wood and the wood is full of keepers hiding behind the trees and the keepers have guns. Guns? They don't have guns. All keepers have guns, Danny. It's for the vermin, mostly the foxes and stoats and weasels that go after the pheasants. But they'll always take a pot at a poacher, too, if they spot him. Dad, you're joking. Not at all. But they only do it from behind. Only when you're trying to escape. They like to pepper you in the legs at about 50 yards. They can't do that. They could go to prison for shooting someone. Well, you could go to prison for poaching. Oh, Dad. Many's the night, Danny, when I was a boy. I've gone into the kitchen and seen my old dad lying face down on the table 
and Mum standing over him, digging the gunshot pellets out of his backside with a potato knife. It's not true. You're joking. You don't believe me, eh? <laughs> Towards the end, he was so covered in tiny little white scars, <laughs> he looked exactly like it was snowing. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not funny. It's horrible. Well, poacher's bottom, they used to call it. What? Uh, yeah, and there wasn't a man in the whole village who didn't have a bit of it one way or another. But my dad was a champion. Wow. Yeah. There's a cocoa. Fine, thanks. Well, if you're hungry, we could have a midnight feast. Could we? Of course. I'll make some sandwiches. Tell me more about it, Dad. Well, this pheasant shooting business, Danny, is practised only by the rich. They're the only people who can afford to rear pheasants just for the fun of shooting them down when they grow up. These wealthy idiots spend huge sums of money every year buying baby pheasants from pheasant farms and rearing them in pens until they're big enough to be put out into the woods. In the woods, the young birds hang around like flocks of chickens and are fed twice a day on the best corn until they're so fat they can hardly fly. Then beaters are hired who walk through the woods clapping their hands and making as much noise as they can to drive the half-tame pheasants towards the half-baked men and their guns. After that, it's bang, 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 and down they come. Oh, yeah, would you like cheese or jam? One of each, please. But, Dad... What? How do you actually catch the pheasants when you're poaching? Do you have a gun? A gun? Real poachers don't shoot pheasants, Danny. Oh. Oh, <laughs> no. You've only got a fire a pistol up in those woods and the keepers will be on you. Then how do you do it? Ah, these things are big secrets. Very big secrets indeed. Here. One cheese, one jam. Thanks. Tell me, Dad, please. Well, seeing as my father could tell them to me, then maybe I could tell them to you. Yes. I promise you won't tell another soul. I promise. Now, here's the thing. Here's the first big secret, Danny. It's the most important discovery in the whole history of poaching. What? Pheasants are crazy about raisins. Is that a big secret? That's it. It may not sound very much when I say it like that, but believe me, it is. Raisins? Just ordinary raisins. It's like, it's like a mania with them. You throw a few raisins into a bunch of pheasants and they'll start fighting each other to get at them. Oh, well, my dad discovered that 40 years ago, just as he discovered these other things I'm about to describe to you. <clears throat> now, method number one. The horse hair stopper. What's that? Shh, shh, shh. You take a few raisins and you soak them in water overnight to make them plump and soft and juicy. <gasps> then you get a bit of good stiff horse hair and you cut it up into half inch lengths. Then you push one of these lengths through the middle of a raisin. So there's just a tiny bit of horse hair sticking out on each side. Now that's all you do. So now you're ready to catch a pheasant. Yeah, right you are. How? Well, when evening comes, you creep up into the woods, making sure you get there before the pheasants have gone up into the trees to roost. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you scutter the raisins, and soon along comes a pheasant and gobbles it up. Yes. Yeah. So then what? Well, well, first of all, the horse hair, see, makes the raisin stick in the pheasant's throat. Does it hurt? No, no, no. It just tickles. But believe it or not, after that, the pheasant never moves its feet again. He becomes absolutely rooted to the spot. Oh. Yeah, yeah. There he stands, pumping his silly neck up and down just like a piston. And all you've got to do is nip out quickly from the place where you're hiding and pick him up. Is that really true, Dad? I swear it. Once a pheasant's had the horsehair stopper, you can turn a hosepipe on him and he won't move. Wow. <laughs> so that's method number one. Yeah, so it is. What's method number two, then? Ah, no. Number two's a real beauty. Yes? Yes. It's a flash of pure brilliance. The sticky hat. The sticky hat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what you do is you dig a little hole in the ground. Right. Yeah. Then you twist a piece of paper into the shape of a cone and you fit this into the hole, hollow end up. Hmm. Yeah. Then <clears throat> you, you smear the inside of the paper cup with glue and drop in a few raisins. I don't believe now it. Now cross my heart and hope to die. Then you lay a trail of raisins along the ground leading up to it. Oh, Dad, you're kidding me. No. Now, the old pheasant comes, 
pecking along the trail, and when he gets to the hole, he pops his head inside to gobble up the raisins. <laughs> and the next thing he knows, he's got a paper hat stuck over his eyes. <laughs> uh, yeah, he can't see a thing. Ain't that a fantastic idea, Danny? Is that the one you used this evening? <laughs> How did you guess? How many did you get? Well, actually, I didn't get any. Dad? No, I, I arrived too late. You didn't. By the time I got there, they were already going up to roost. Oh. Just shows how out of practice I am. Was it fun all the same? Oh, marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. Just like the old days. Now, time for sleep, Danny. I'll never get to sleep now. Oh, yes, you will. I'm ready for sleep, that's for sure. Turn out the lamp, will you? There's a good lad. Often after I've gone to sleep without me knowing it? No. Tonight was the first time for nine years. Why? Well, when your mother died, Danny, I I made a vow to give up poaching until you were old enough to be left alone at nights. And I'm old enough now? No, lad, I, I broke my vow. Oh. You see, I had such a tremendous longing to go up into the woods again, I, I, I just couldn't stop myself. I'm very sorry. If you ever want to go again, Dad, I won't mind. Do you mean that? Do you really mean it? Yes, so long as you tell me beforehand. You will promise to tell me, Dad. And you're quite sure you won't mind? Quite sure. <laughs> you're a good boy. And we'll have roast pheasant for supper whenever you want it. And, Dad? What? One day. Yeah? One day, will you take me with you? Ah, well, I reckon you're just a bit young to be dodging around up there in the dark. I wouldn't want you to get peppered with buckshot in the backside at your age. But you're the took you at my age. Yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. But I'd like to get back into practice before I make any promises, you understand? Yes. I wouldn't want to take you with me until I'm right back in my old form. No. Well, good night, Danny. You go to sleep now. Good night, Dad. <laughs> The next Friday, while we were having supper in the caravan, my father announced that he wanted to go up to Hazel's Wood the next evening, if it was all right with me. I, of course, said that it was fine with me, but why Hazel's Wood? Was it always Hazel's Wood? Yes, it was always Hazel's Wood. And there are two reasons for that, Danny. One is because that's where all the pheasants are. And second because I don't like Mr Victor Hazel one little bit. Neither do I. He's such a snob. Yeah, made all his money out of that brewery of his, but pretends he's royalty. Yeah. Hunting with hounds and holding shooting parties to try and get in with the right people. No, he's a bad one, Victor Hazel is. Remember that time last year when he arrived on the forecourt in his enormous silver Rolls Royce? Yeah, how could I forget it? His great, glistening, beery face about the wheel, pink as a ham, all soft and swollen like from drinking too much beer. Aye! Fill her up and look sharp about it, boy. Here's the key. And keep your filthy little hands to yourself. Do you understand? What do you mean, sir? What do I mean? What do I mean? I mean what I say, boy. See this? Yes, sir. This is my best riding crop. Yes, sir. And if you make any dirty finger marks on my paintwork, I'll step right out of this car and give you a good hiding. Hey! I don't like you speaking to my son like that. Huh? You had no reason to threaten him. He's done nothing wrong. Well, I... Next time you threaten someone with a good hiding, I suggest you pick on a person your own size. Oh, come on! Like me, for instance. Now go away, please. We do not wish to serve you. I'll love you for this. You'll see if I don't! No, oh, Danny. I don't like Victor Hazel one little bit. You remember all those officials he kept sending around to check up on us? Yes, that man who came to inspect the caravan. Yeah, that's right. To see if it's a fit place for humans to live in, eh? 
<laughs> and then there was that inspector who took samples of petrol from the underground storage tank to see if we were mixing some of our second-grade petrol in with the first-grade stuff. Which we weren't. Well, of course we weren't. No. Hardly a week went by without some local official dropping in to check on something or other. And that's why, Danny, that's why I take a certain pleasure in poaching Mr Victor Hazel's pheasants. <laughs> next day was poaching day, and from the moment my father got out of his bunk in the morning, the excitement began to build up inside him. We spent the day in the workshop, repairing an old Austin 7. I want to be away by six o'clock. Then I'll get to the wood exactly at twilight. Why twilight? Ah, because that's when everything inside the wood becomes veiled and shady. You can see to move around, but it's not easy for someone else to see you. Oh. Yeah. And when danger threatens, you can always hide in the shadows which are darker than a wolf's mouth. Why don't you wait till it gets really dark? Then you wouldn't be seen at all. Well, you wouldn't catch anything if you did that, Danny. Oh. See, when night comes on, all the pheasants fly up into the trees to roost. They're just like other birds. They never sleep on the ground. Are you going to use a sticky hat? Or will it be the horse hair stopper? Sticky hat. Great! Oh, I'm very fond of the sticky hat. When will you be back? About ten o'clock. Ten thirty at the latest. I promise I'll be back by ten thirty. OK. Now, you sure you don't mind being left alone? I don't mind, but, well... What? You will be all right, won't you, Dad? <laughs> oh, don't you worry about me. I'll be just fine. How many keepers are there now in Hazel's Wood? Oh, not too many. Not too many at all. Right, I'm off now, Danny. Now, promise not to wait up for me. I promise. Put yourself to bed at eight and go to sleep, right? Bye, Dad. Bye, Danny. Be good now. Good luck. Inside the caravan, I lit the oil lamps and tried to do some homework but I found it impossible to keep my mind on my books. I kept thinking of Dad. Half past seven. Where would he be now? Just wriggling through the hedge and entering the wood. I could see him, treading carefully over the leafy ground, stopping, listening, going on again, and all the time searching and searching for the keeper who would somewhere be standing still as a post. Keepers hardly move at all when they're in a wood watching for poachers. They stand dead still right up against the trunk of a tree and it's not easy to spot a motionless man in that position at twilight when the shadows are as dark as a wolf's mouth. I closed my books. It was no good trying to work. I decided to go to bed instead. I undressed and put on my pyjamas and climbed into my bunk. I left the lamp burning. Soon I fell asleep. Hello, my beauties. Look what I've got for you. Lovely raisins. Ah, that's it. Your favourites. Steady now. Here we are. Uh, oh! Oh! A trap! A wretched trap! Ah! My ankle! Danny! Did you hear something? Oh, I heard it all right. I do believe our little trap has worked. Ah, so let's just go and see who we've got down there, eh? Right. Now then, let's have a look. Shine your torch down the pit. Ah, <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Hello there, stranger. Who is it? Can't tell. He's covered his face. Covering your face won't do you no good in the end. You can't get out of there. No, not till we come and get you in the morning. <laughs> That's right, in the morning. I reckon to Sam Buller, no. Too small for old Sam. It's Reg, that's who it is. 
It's Reg Davis. Or Travis. No. No, it could be young Travis. No, Travis. I, I've seen him in here before, up to no good. Well, we'll find out who you are all right in the morning, my lad. Ah, I guess who's coming with us to fish you out, eh? Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Can't got your tongue and all, has it? <laughs> well, then, I'll tell you who's coming with us. Victor Angel himself is coming with us to say hello to you. Oh, boy! I hate to think what he's going to do when he gets his hands on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he won't like that, will he? Oh, Danny. Forgive me, Danny. Oh, what a fool. What a fool I've been. Suddenly, I opened my eyes again, woken by a bad dream. The oil lamp was still glowing, and the clock on the wall said ten minutes past two. Ten past two? Dad? Dad, are you home? Dad! You promised you'd be back. He's been gone over eight hours. Eight hours! Perhaps the keepers have shot him. Maybe he can't walk. I quickly put on my shirt and jeans. How long would it take me to get to the wood? An hour and a half? Less if I ran most of the way. My hands were shaking and my stomach had that awful prickly feeling as though it were full of small needles. I ran down the steps of the caravan and across to the workshop to get the torch. I grabbed it and paused for a moment beside the pumps. The moon had long since disappeared but the sky was clear and a great mass of stars was wheeling above my head. Going away into the blackness of the countryside lay the lonely road that led to the dangerous wood. Six and a half miles. I'll have to keep up a steady pace. <gasps> the baby Austin! The baby Austin! I'll get to Hazelswood much quicker in the car. I won't pretend I wasn't petrified. I was. My father had always let me drive the cars into the workshop and back them out again, and sometimes I would drive them slowly around the pumps in first gear. I released the clutch very slowly and at the same time pressed down just a fraction of an inch on the accelerator. And stealthily, oh, most wonderfully, the little car began to lean forward and steal into motion. I was off. I knew every bit of the road, every curve and every little rise and dip. To reach Hazel's Wood, you had to turn left through a gap in the hedge and go uphill over a bumpy track for about a quarter of a mile. Suddenly, far ahead of me, I saw a splash of yellow light. A car. He got brighter and brighter and nearer and nearer. My turning place must be very close now. I pressed my foot down for more speed. The approaching car grew bigger and bigger and then swish, went past me like a bullet. But in the tiny fraction of a second when the two of us were alongside one another, I caught a glimpse of its white painted body and I knew it was the police. Did you see what I saw? A kid. That was a kid. Yeah, you bet she was. Couldn't have been more than eight or nine. Turn round. After him. Yeah, right you are, Sarge. All at once I saw the tiny gap in the hedge. There wasn't time to brake or slow down, so I just yanked the wheel hard over and prayed. The car swerved off the road, leapt through the gap, hit the rising ground, bounced high in the air, and then skidded round sideways behind the hedge and stopped. I sat, quiet as a mouse, for a long time. I heard the sound of the police car coming back in my direction. It was making a terrific noise, going flat out. He whizzed past me like a rocket. He must have been very puzzled. He's disappeared. He's gone. Little blighter. Joyrider, do you reckon? I'd say. But he can't have disappeared. We've been doing 90. Are you sure we saw what we thought we saw? Either that or we've just seen a ghost, Sarge. I waited to see if the car would come back. It didn't. I switched on my lights and drove very slowly. And at last, ahead of me and over to the right, looking like some gigantic black creature crouching on the crest of the hill, I saw Hazel's Wood. Dad! Dad! 
Dad, are you there? Dad, it's Danny! Are you there? Answer me! Dad, please! Tell me where you are! Please answer! Dad, it's Danny! Over here! Dad, is that you? Over here! I'm here! Where are you, Danny? I'm coming! I'm here, Dad! Don't run! Stop! I can't see you! I'm down here. Come forward slowly, but careful. I'm in a pit just ahead of you. Don't fall in! Oh, Dad! Hello, my marvellous darling. Thank you for coming. Are you all right? Well, my my ankle's broken, I think. It, it happened when I fell in. This pit's enormous. Yeah, about 12 feet deep, I'd say. Dug with a mechanical shovel. A trap. A trap? A people trap, you mean? That's right, Danny. Oh, does it hurt? Yeah, it hurts a lot. But the point is, I've got to get out of here before morning. The keepers know I'm here. And they're coming back for me as soon as it gets light. Do the keepers know who you are? No. Two of them came and shone a light down on me, but I covered my face. They couldn't recognise me. Have they gone for the night? Yeah. What time is it? Look, shine the light down so I can see. Oh, ten to three. I must be out of here before sunrise. Dad? Yes? I brought the car. The car? I came in the baby Austin. You did what? I wanted to get here quickly, so I just drove it out of the workshop and came straight here. You mean you actually drove here in the baby Austin? Yes. <laughs> You're crazy. You're absolutely plum crazy. It wasn't difficult. You could have been killed. It went fine, Dad. But where is it now? Just outside the wood on the bumpy track. Dad, are you all right? You're shivering. Yeah, I, I, I'm OK. If we could get you out, I'm sure I could help you to the car. You could lean on me and hop on one leg. I'll never get out of here without a ladder. What about a rope? There's a rope in the baby Austin. A tow rope. I'll get it. I'll be back soon. <laughs> And so, with one end of the rope tied to a tree, I lowered the other end down to my father in the pit, and eventually I got him out. He lay on the ground, breathing fast and loud. After a while, he held onto me with both hands and began to hop forward on one leg. After lots of rests, we reached the hedge and finally found our way back to the car. I drove very carefully back to the filling station. Dad lay down on the workshop floor, and I fetched a blanket and pillows from the caravan. I sat next to him in an old wooden chair. I'll have to go to hospital, Danny. The ankle must be set properly and put in plaster. Should we go to the hospital now, Dad? No, I'll, I'll just lie down on the floor and wait till it's time to call Doc Spencer. He'll arrange everything. Call him now. No, 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 I, I don't want to wake him. We'll call him at seven. What'll you tell him? I mean, about how it happened. I'll tell him the truth, Danny. The truth? Yeah. Doc Spencer's a good friend. Oh, I'm sorry I made such a mess of things, Danny. I'm sorry. Close your eyes, Dad. Just try and get some sleep. <laughs> That's a nasty one, William. We'd better get you to hospital right away. How's the pain? Would you like me to give you something? Oh, no, Doc. I'll wait till I get there. As you wish. But how on earth did you do it? Did you fall down the steps of that crazy caravan? Oh, not exactly. 
As a matter of fact, I was mooching around up in Hazel's Wood. Ah, I see. Plenty of pheasants? Yes, yeah, stacks of them. It's a great game. <laughs> oh, I only wish I was young enough to have another go at it. You, Doc Spencer? Oh, yes, Danny. I used to slip out the back door and go striding over the fields to one of my secret places. Sometimes it was pheasants and other times it was trout. Uh, keep, keep, keep still, William. Try not to move. An ambulance will be here soon. Which method did you use for pheasants? Gin and raisins. I used to soak the raisins in gin for a week, then scatter them in the woods. Uh, no, it doesn't work. I know, but it was enormous fun. But I was hot stuff with trout. Oh, do you know how to catch a trout, Danny, without using a rod and line? No. How? You tickle him. Tickle him? Yes. You go creeping along the bank until you see a big one, and you come up behind him and you lie down on your tummy, and you lower your hand slowly into the water, slide it underneath him, then stroke his belly with the tip of one finger. Really? He loves it so much he sort of dozes off. Then you grab hold of him and flip him out of the water and onto the bank. <laughs> I take my hat off to you, Doc. Only a great artist can do it. <laughs> Thank you, William. Now tell me, was it a rabbit hole you fell down in the wood? Uh, no. It was an enormous great man-made pit. A people trap? I don't believe it. Really deep? Great heavens alive. Victor Hazel can't go digging tiger traps in his woods for human beings. He can well, he has. It's diabolical. Decent folk can't even go out and have a little fun at night without risking breaking our necks. I never did like that hazel man. He once kicked my dog, you know. Oh, what? yes, 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 my old dog. My father was in hospital overnight, but by the next evening he was back in the caravan. Hard white plaster covered the lower part of his leg and the whole of his foot. Doc Spencer bought us a fabulous pie as a present, and soon my father was hobbling around the filling station and life began to return to normal. Or anyway, nearly to normal. A change had come over my father. He was broody and there would be silences between us, especially at supper time. Many times I wanted to ask him what the trouble was, and had I done so, I'm sure he would have told me at once. In any event, I knew that sooner or later I would hear all about it. I hadn't long to wait. You know what makes me so hopping mad, Danny? What? <laughs> well, I get up in the mornings feeling pretty good. Then about nine o'clock every single day of the week. That huge silver Rolls Royce comes swishing past and I see the great big bloated face of Mr Victor Hazel behind the wheel. And he always looks at me in a sneering way and it makes me madder than a mackerel. I don't blame you, Dad. And I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. The shooting season for pheasants starts on Saturday and every year Mr Hazel celebrates the occasion by giving a grand opening day shooting party. Wow! Who goes to it? Oh, hundreds of people. Cool! Well, they come from miles. Dukes and lords, barons and baronets, wealthy businessmen and all the fancy folk in the county. They come with their guns and their dogs and their wives and all day long the noise of shooting rolls across the valley. Do they all like Mr Hazel then? No. Truth is, they all despise him. Why do they come? Because, Danny, it's the best pheasant shoot in the south of England. Oh. <laughs> it's the greatest day in Hazel's year, and he's willing to pay almost anything to make it a success. Mm. Each summer, he buys hundreds of young pheasants and puts them in the wood where the keepers feed them and guard them and fatten them up, ready for the great day. Huh. It makes him feel important. For one day in the year, he becomes a big cheese in a little world. Oh, I see. Yeah, but I've been thinking. What, Dad? Well... 
I've been wondering. What? Well, this is what I dearly love to do. I would like to find a way of poaching so many pheasants from Hazel's Wood that there wouldn't be any left for the big opening day shoot on October the 1st. Dad, no! Shh, shh. Mr. Hazel's party would be the biggest washout in history if we could find a way of knocking off a, a couple of hundred birds all in one go. Two hundred? Yeah, imagine, Danny. What a triumph. What a glorious victory that would be. You mean he'd take all the lords and barons and businessmen to the wood with their guns and there wouldn't be any pheasants? Not a single one. Dad! Now, wouldn't that be the most fantastic, marvellous thing if we could pull it off? There's no way, Dad. It's hard enough just getting two birds, let alone two hundred. It's the keepers that make it so difficult. How many are there? Keepers? Mm. Three. And they're always around. Not all through the night, they aren't. True. They go off home as soon as all the pheasants are safely up in the trees, roosting. But nobody's ever discovered a way of poaching a roosting pheasant. No. Mm. Still, it's about your bedtime. Off you go, and I'll come in and tell you a story. An idea was beginning to form in my head as I got into my pyjamas. A way of poaching two hundred roosting pheasants was slowly making its way into my brain. I got into my bunk and waited for my father to come in from outside. He appeared, lit the oil lamp, and sat down in his usual spot. I was bursting with excitement about my new theory. Tonight, it was going to be me telling the story. Dad? Hmm? I think I've just had an idea. Oh, yeah? Well, go on. You know that bottle of sleeping pills Doc Spencer gave you when you came back from hospital? Oh, I never used them. I don't like the things. Just as well. Why? Well, is there any reason why they wouldn't work on a pheasant? <laughs> Listen. Oh, no, no, I can see what you're getting at, Danny, but it's no use. No pheasant in the world is going to swallow those lousy red capsules. Raisins, Dad. Hey. You're forgetting the raisins. Well, what do they got to do with it? We take a raisin. Mm hmm We soak it till it swells. Right. Then we make a tiny slit in one side of it with a razor blade. Mm hmm Then we hollow it out a little, open up one of your red capsules and pour all of the powder into the raisin. Aha! Uh -huh. Then we get a needle and thread and very carefully sew up the slit. Well, blow me down. Now we have a nice, clean-looking raisin, chock full of sleeping pill powder, and that ought to be enough to put any pheasant to sleep. Oh, my darling boy. I do believe you've got it. Have I? Yes, you have, you have. With this method, we could prepare 200 raisins, and all we'd have to do is scatter them round the feeding grounds at sunset. And then walk away. Yes. Yeah. Half an hour later, we would go back into the wood. By which time, the pheasants would be up in the trees roosting. And the pills would be beginning to work. And the pheasants would be starting to feel groggy. And soon, every pheasant that had eaten one single raisin would topple over unconscious and fall to the ground. Yes. And all we'd have to do... Is walk round, picking them all up. Exactly. Oh, you're a genius, Danny. Dad, can I do it with you? A genius. And they'd never catch us either. Dad? We'd simply stroll through the woods, dropping a few raisins here and there as we went, and, and even if they were watching us, they wouldn't notice anything. You will let me, won't you? Uh, let you what? You will let me come with you. Oh, Danny, my love, if this thing works, it'll revolutionise poaching. Yes, but can I come with you? Come with me? Yeah, of course you can come with me. It's your idea. You must be there to see it happen. Oh, thanks, Dad. Now then, uh, where are those pills? On the shelf, there. Right. Yeah, here we are, then. Uh, well, there aren't 200 here. So, what we'll need to do is divide the powder from one pill among several raisins. Will that be enough to put a pheasant to sleep? Of course. Just think how much smaller a pheasant is than a man. This will knock a pheasant out, that's for sure. <laughs> What'll we call it? What? What'll we call the method? Ah, yeah. We'll call it the Sleeping Beauty. It'll be a landmark in the history of poaching. I can't believe it, Dad. What can't you believe? That you're a genius? No, that we're going to swipe all of Mr Hazel's prize pheasants. It's too good to be true. Yeah, yeah, well now, we must keep very calm and make our plans. The shooting party's on Saturday. 
in three days' time. So, the night before, on the Friday, we do the job. Right. Yeah. So, we've got to get 200 raisins ready by Friday. But I'll be at school on Friday. Yeah, no, you won't. I will? No, you'll have a very nasty cold on Friday, and I shall be forced to keep you home. Great! Yeah. We won't open the filling station, but instead we'll shut ourselves in here and prepare the raisins. And that evening, off we'll go up the road to do the job. Is that all clear? All clear. And Danny, not a whisper of this to any of your friends at school. Dad, you know I wouldn't. Captain Lancaster, my teacher, was a violent man. He'd been a captain in the army during the war against Hitler, and that was why he still called himself Captain Lancaster, instead of just plain Mr. You! Stand up! Me, sir? Yes, you, you blithering idiot! You were talking! What were you saying? Come on, boy, out with it! I'm still waiting, boy! What was it you were saying? I... I didn't say anything. I saw you talking to Sidney Morgan. I'm not a fool. I fought and bled for my country. I can see a boy's lips move. Sidney Morgan asked you a question. Um, well, uh... Well, did he or didn't he? Um, he, well... Did Sidney Morgan ask you a question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Captain Lancaster, sir. Yes, Captain Lancaster, sir. And you answered him, didn't you? Yes, sir. And what was the question? What are eight nines, sir? Speak up! What are eight nines? He asked me what are eight nines, sir. And what are eight nines? Seventy-two, sir. Eight nines are seventy-two, nine nines are eighty-one, ten nines are ninety, eleven nines are ninety-nine, twelve nines are one hundred and eight, and I will not have cheating in my class. You may be permitted to cheat and lie and swindle in your own homes, but I will not put up with it here. Cheating is a repulsive habit practised by gutter snipes and dandy brats. What is it? It's a repulsive habit, sir. Practised by... Gutter snipes and dandy prats, sir. Gutter snipes and dandy prats. Cheating is a repulsive habit practised by... I am not a cheat, sir. You are not only a cheat, but you are insolent. You are a very insolent boy. Come up here. Captain Lancaster reached up to the topmost bookshelf and brought down the dreaded cane. White as a bone, and very long and very thin, with one end bent over into a handle. Hold out your left hand. What a nice pink palm you have. Well, not for long. Ow! Ow! Pull yourself together, boy, and go and sit down. And let us have no more cheating, and no more insolence either. Right, Danny. Fetch me a bowl of water, will you? OK, Dad. You all right? Yeah. <laughs> now, here. Open up the packets and put all those raisins in to soak. That's it. Hey, what happened to your hand? Uh, it's nothing. Who did it? Was it Captain Lancaster? Yes, Dad, but it's nothing. What happened? He called me a cheat. Sidney Morgan asked me a question and I answered, and he called me a cheat and a gutter snipe and a dandy prat and... I'll kill him. I swear I'll kill him. Forget it. Dad. I will not forget it. You did nothing wrong, and he had absolutely no right to do this to you. Where are you going? I'm going straight to Captain Lancaster's house, and I'm going to beat the living daylights out of him. No, don't, Dad, please. It won't do any good. Please don't do it. I've got to. No, it'll ruin everything. It'll only make things worse. Please forget it. It's revolting. I bet they did it to you when you were at school. Yeah, of course they did. And I bet your dad didn't go rushing off to beat the living daylights out of the teacher who did it. Well, no, Danny, he didn't. I'm going to put the raisins in now. And don't forget, tomorrow I have a nasty cold and won't be going to school. Yeah, that's right. And does it still hurt, that hand? No, not one bit. That night I couldn't get to sleep. I was so steamed up and excited about Hazel's wood. I think he must have got himself steamed up almost as much because I heard him twisting and turning all over the place in his bunk. At about 10.30, 
He climbed out of bed and put the kettle on. What is it, Dad? What's the matter? Nothing. Shall we have a midnight feast? The next day, we got up very early and started stuffing the raisins and sewing them up. It took about two minutes for each raisin from start to finish. Now, your mother was wonderful at sewing things. She'd have had these done in no time. Here, did you know she used to make all my clothes herself? Even socks and sweaters? Oh, yeah. When she was knitting, the needles flew so fast in her fingers you couldn't see them. They were just a blur. I would sit there in the evening watching her, and she used to talk about the children she was going to have. <laughs> yeah, I shall have three children, she used to say. A boy for you, a girl for me, and one for good measure. When Mum was here, Dad... Yeah? Did you go out very often at night? What, poaching, you mean? Yes. At least twice a week. Didn't she mind? Mind? Yes. No, oh, of course not. Oh. oh. She came with me. She did it. <laughs> she certainly did. Every single time, until just before you were born. Well, she had to stop then. She said she couldn't run fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> did she go because she loved you, Dad, and she wanted to be with you? Oh, well... <laughs> or did she go because she loved poaching? Both. She did it for both reasons. Weren't you afraid she might get shot up? Yes, Danny, I was. But it was marvellous to have her along. She was a great sport, your mother. You hungry? Nope. Oh. My stomach's all jumpy, full of snakes. They won't stop wriggling about. Oh, I'm surprised. I was the same the first time I went out. Do you know what this is, Danny? What? This is the most colossal and extraordinary poaching job anyone has ever been on in the history of the world. Oh, don't go on, Dad. It only makes me more jumpy. Sorry. Well, that's the last raisin. Don't I look marvellous? Yup. Time to get ready. We leave in 15 minutes. It was a calm, sunny evening, with little wisps of brilliant white cloud hanging motionless in the sky. My father came out of the caravan wearing the old navy blue sweater and a brown cloth cap with a peak pulled down low over his eyes. What's under your jumper, Dad? A couple of cotton sacks to carry the stuff. Aha! Yeah. Well, Danny, this is it. We're on the way now. Ooh, your mother would have loved this. She was a great one for walking, she was. Do you think they might have dug any more of those pits for us to fall into? Oh, I'll be on the lookout for them this time. We'll go very carefully and very slowly once we're in the wood. How do we stop the keepers from seeing us? Ha <laughs> ha! The greatest game of hide-and-seek in the world, that is. Why? Because they've got guns? Yeah, well, that does add a bit of a flavour to it, yes. Here, I'll tell you something. What, Dad? Something interesting about pheasants. The law says that they're wild birds, mm -hmm. so they only belong to you when they're on your own land. Did you know that? No. Yeah. So, if one of Mr Hazel's pheasants flew over and perched on our filling station... It would belong to us. Absolutely. No one else would be allowed to touch it. You mean even if Mr Hazel had bought it himself as a chick? Oh, yeah. Once it flies off his own land, he's lost it. Unless, of course, it flies back again. It's the same with fish. Once a trout or a salmon has swum out of your stretch of the river, you can't very well say, hey, that's mine, I want it back, can you? No, oh. of course not. But I didn't know it was like that with pheasants. Same with all game. Ah, here we are, the cart track. Just look at that wood with the sun going down behind the trees. It's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, no talking once we're inside. Right, Dad. And keep very close to me and try not to go snapping any branches. Hold my hand now. In we go. 
We'll make the clearing where the young birds are introduced into the wood. There's always plenty of them there. Now keep close behind me. We're going to have to crawl the next bit. So we crawled. And at last we were kneeling safely behind a big clump of bushes right on the edge of the clearing. My father nudged me with his elbow and pointed through the branches at the pheasants. The place was absolutely stiff with them. There must have been at least 200 huge birds strutting around among the tree stumps. A fantastic sight. A poacher's dream come true. The hens were plump and creamy brown. They were so fat their breast feathers almost brushed the ground as they walked. The cocks were slim and elegant, with long tails and brilliant red patches round the eyes. My father's face was transfixed in ecstasy. The mouth was slightly open and the eyes were sparkling bright as they stared at the pheasants. Aren't they the most beautiful things? Oh, there's a keeper. Over there. Don't move. The other side, by that big tree. Dad. Shh. Stay well down. Yes, but Dad. It's all right. He can't see us. We crouched close to the ground watching the keeper. He was a smallish man with a cap on his head and a big double-barreled shotgun under his arm. He never moved. He was like a post standing there. Should we go? No. Slowly, never taking his eyes from the keeper, my father reached into his pocket and brought out a single raisin. Quickly, with a flick of the wrist, he threw it high into the air. I watched as it sailed over the bushes and I saw it land within a yard of two hen birds who were standing beside a tree stump. They both turned their heads sharply. Then one of them hopped over and made a quick peck at the ground. And that must have been it. She's got it. Yeah. I'm sweating. Shh. Let's try some more. My father threw a second raisin into the clearing. Then a third and a fourth. He kept throwing them one at a time. Then all at once I saw the keeper turn away his head to inspect the wood behind him. Quick as a flash, my father pulled the bag of raisins out of his pocket and tipped the whole lot into the palm of his right hand. He flung the entire handful way over the bushes into the clearing where they fell with a soft patter. Hello, hello. What the devil was that? Lie down flat. Stay there. Don't move an inch. Hmm. Could have sworn I heard something. Don't you just love this? Ah, maybe not. Imagination playing tricks on me. <sighs> Panic's over. Now follow me, Danny. But be extra careful. He's still there. Right. And keep down low all the time. Then when I give the word, run. We crawled along quickly, and I kept thinking of the keeper who was somewhere behind us. I was also very conscious of my backside and how it was sticking up in the air for all to see. I could understand now why poacher's bottom was such a common complaint in this business. We went along on our hands and knees for about a hundred yards. Then Dad gave the word. Now, run! <laughs> It went marvellously. Didn't it go absolutely marvellously? Did the keeper see us? Ah, not on your life. <laughs> and in a few minutes, the sun will be going down and the birds will all be flying up to roost and that keeper will be sloping off home to his supper. Then what, Dad? Oh, then we go back in again and help ourselves. <laughs> we'll be picking them up off the ground like pebbles. <laughs> I don't believe it. Oh, you did well, Danny. I'm right proud of you. Oh, thanks, Dad. So we sat on the grassy bank below the hedge and waited for darkness. The sun had set now, and the sky was a pale smoke blue, faintly glazed with yellow. <sighs> you could offer me anywhere in the world at this moment, and I wouldn't go. We pulled it off, Danny. 
Doesn't that make you feel good? Terrific. But it was scary while it lasted. Ah, uh-huh. well, that's what poaching's all about. It scares the pants off us. That's why we love it. How long does the sleeping pill take to work? I don't know. About half an hour, I expect. Might be different with pheasants, though, Dad. It might. And we've got to wait a while anyway to give the keepers time to go home. I brought a couple of apples to keep us going. Oh, thanks. You know, one nice thing about a Cox's Orange Pippin is that the pips rattle when it's ripe. Shake it and you can hear them rattling. Oh, yes. Look out. There's someone coming. Uh Uh-oh. Another keeper. He's got a shotgun. And a whacking great dog. What do we do? Just sit tight and don't say a word. Wow. And who have we here? Good evening. I know you. I know the both of you. Yes. You're from the filling station. You're from the filling station and that's your boy. And you live in that filthy old caravan, right? Oh, what are we playing? 20 questions? Beat it. Get out. Go on. Push off. This happens to be a public footpath. Kindly leave us alone. You're loitering with intent to commit a nuisance. I could run you in for that. No, you couldn't. Dad? Shh. See, you broke your foot. Didn't by any chance fall into a hole in the ground, did you? It's been a nice walk, Danny, but it's time we went home for our supper. Come on. Good day to you, Mr Rabbit. Yeah. I'll give you good day. I know you're up to something. Think I was born yesterday. That's the head keeper. Mr Rabbit? Yeah, that's right. Good name, eh? <laughs> Do we have to go home, Dad? Home? My dear boy, we're just beginning. Now, come on, sit yourself down. We'll be all right here behind the edge. We'll just wait for him to go off for his supper. He won't be coming back tonight. Are you sure? I'm positive. What about the other one? The one in the clearing? Yeah, he'll be gone too. Mightn't one of them be waiting for us at the bottom of the track? No point. There's at least 20 different ways of reaching the road when you come out of Hazel's Wood. Mr Rabbits knows that. Now just think, Danny. Any time now, 200 pheasants will be falling out of the branches like raindrops. The three-quarter moon was well above the hills now, and the sky was filled with stars as we climbed back over the gate and began walking back up the track towards the wood. Little glints and glimmers of light from the brilliant moon shone through the leaves and gave the place a cold, eerie look. Here, Danny. Take this torch. We'll need a light each. You don't think Mr. Rabbits might have sneaked back again just to make sure? Ah, not a chance. He'll want his supper. Now, come on. Take my hand. That's it. Here's where we threw the raisins. What do we do? We wait. Are they all roosting? Yeah. They're all around us. They don't go far. Danny. What? I've been wondering about something. How can a bird keep its balance? sitting on a branch when it's asleep. By holding on with its long toes and claws. Yes, but it's peculiar. Why doesn't it topple off its perch as soon as it goes to sleep? I just reckon if a bird can keep its balance when it's asleep, then surely there isn't any reason why the pill should make it fall down. It's doped. Surely it'll fall down if it's doped. Mm. I'm not so sure. I should have tested it out with roosters. That's what my dad would have done. (gasps) What was that? Shh! There's another. They're pheasants. Wait. They must be pheasants, Dad. You may well be right. Put your torch on. Over here, Dad. Two of them were over here. Uh, I thought they were this way. Now keep looking. Oh, here's one. Look. Fantastic. Oh, it's dope to high heaven. It won't wait for a week. There's another. Two more jeepers. They're falling all around us. This is incredible. Oh, one just fell right on top of me. Oh, pick them up, Danny. Oh, they're beautiful. So soft and warm. I'll pile them here. Just pile them up where it's light. Oh, I've never seen anything like it. It's a miracle. It's too many. No, I'll keep gathering them up. Oh, I say, Danny. What? What do you think the great Mr. Victor Hazel would say if he could see this, eh? <laughs> Don't even think about it. Oh, oh, keep searching. There's plenty more on the ground. Don't you think we ought to get out while the going's good? Never. Not in your life. Shouldn't we just take about six each and get out quick? I want to count them. 
Dad, not now. Oh, no, I must, I must. Oh. Can't we do that later? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He began counting very carefully, picking up each bird in turn and laying it to one side. The moon was directly overhead now and the whole clearing was brilliantly lit up. I felt as though I was standing in the glare of powerful headlamps. 117, 118, 119, 120. Oh, it's an all-time record. The most my dad ever got was 15, and he was drunk for a week afterwards. You don't think the keeper's watching us this very moment from behind a tree? Nah, no chance. If he's anywhere, he'll be down at the filling station, waiting to catch us coming home with the loot. But we can't carry all this home. No, of course not. There'll be a taxi waiting for us on the track outside the wood. A taxi? Oh, yeah, you need a taxi on a big job. You see, nobody knows who's inside a taxi, except the driver. Which driver? Charlie Kinch. Never! Yeah, he's only too happy to oblige. He's poached more pheasants in his time than we've sold gallons of petrol. Wow! <laughs> he won't ever have seen all like this, though. <whistles> An all-time world record. And you did it, Danny. The whole thing was your idea in the first place. I didn't do it, Oh, Dad. yes, you did. And do you know what that makes you, my dear boy? No, what? That makes you the champion of the world. <laughs> How about that then, Charlie? How about that for a haul, eh? Right. Who did you do it? Ah, Danny did it. My son Danny is the champion of the world. Well, he reckon pheasants is going to be a bit scarce about Mr Victor Hazel's opening day shoot tomorrow, eh, hey, Willem? <laughs> I think they are, Charlie. I think they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those fancy folk driving in from miles around in their big shiny cars and there won't be a blinking bird anywhere for them to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but, Dad... Yeah. What are you going to do with them all? Oh, share them out. There's a dozen for Charlie here for a start, right, Charlie? Suits me. Then there'll be a dozen for Doc Spencer, and another dozen for Enoch Samways. Sergeant Samways? Oh, got to keep the village policeman happy, Danny. He likes a piece of roasted pheasant as much as the next man. I reckon he knows a thing about catching them as well. Really? <laughs> are you dumping the birds off at Mrs Clipstone's place tonight? That's it, Charlie. Straight to Mrs Clipstone's, if you would. We'll just drop them off in the coal shed, as usual. Why, Mrs Clipstone? Mrs Clipstone delivers everyone's pheasants. What? The vicar's wife? That's right. The vicar's wife delivers the pheasants? Always choose a respectable woman to deliver your pheasants. That's it, Willem, that's it. Yeah, the vicar's very fond of roast pheasant for his dinner. Who isn't, Willem? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Who isn't? Ah, ah, here we are. The vicarage. We said goodbye to Charlie Kinch and began to walk, my father and I, the two miles back to the filling station. We soon left the village behind and we were in open country. There was no one else in sight. My father's face was alight with happiness and his arms were waving all over the place as he went prancing along the middle of the road. Roasted pheasant! The finest and most succulent dish on earth. Does it have to be roasted? Of course! You don't ever boil a young bird. Why do you ask that? Well, we don't have an oven. We've only got a paraffin burner. Yeah, I know. And that is why we'll go straight into the village tomorrow morning and we shall buy an electric oven. Wow! And I'll tell you what else we've got to get. One of those deep freezers where you can store things for months and months and they never go rotten. Dad, no! Look, even after we've given birds away to all our friends, there'll still be about 50 left for us. But it'll cost the earth. And worth every penny. <gasps> Look! Yes. We're nearly home. Do you think Mr. Rabbits will be waiting for us? <sighs> if he is, you won't see him. They hide and watch you from behind a hedge or a tree. They only come out if you're carrying a sack. And we, Danny, are not carrying anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get Doc Spencer over first thing tomorrow. He won't believe his ears when he hears what we've done. It was the greatest time I've ever had in my whole life.
What a triumph! What a miracle! <laughs> what a victory! You're a genius, sir! <laughs> Hail to thee, dear Danny! You're the champion of the world! <laughs> <laughs> oh, here she comes! Here she comes, Doctor! Here who comes? Mrs. Clipstone, down the road there, see? Is that her? In the distance? It certainly is, Danny. What's she pushing? Well, there's only one way of delivering pheasants safely, and that's under a baby. Isn't that right, Doctor? Under a baby? We're in a pram with the baby on top. Ah, I see. Fantastic. See? That's young Christopher Clipstone sitting up in the pram, and underneath him there's more than a hundred pheasants. Well, you can't put a hundred pheasants in a child's perambulator. Well, you can if it's been specially made for the job. Extra long and extra wide, this one is, and extra deep underneath. Did you make it yourself, Dad? Yeah, more or less. Cool. Yeah, I converted their other pram into this special extra-large poacher's model. A bunch of pheasants makes a nice soft mattress for a baby. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Yeah, you'll be having a very comfortable ride today. Mrs Clipstone seems in a bit of a hurry. Look, she's started to run. Well, she does seem to be going a bit quick, doesn't she? She's going very quick. Well, perhaps she doesn't want to be caught in the rain. She doesn't want the baby to get wet. She could put the hood up. Oh, she's running, all right. Running like the wind. Hello. What's up, Dad? There's something wrong with that baby. Can you hear him? Yes, I can hear him. He's yelling his head off. Well, he's having a fit. That's why she's running. He's having a fit and she wants to get him uh, in here quick and put him under the cold tap. Look, here comes a lorry. She'll be run over if she's not careful. Good grief. Look, it's a pheasant. A pheasant. A pheasant's just flown out of the pram. Like it. There goes another one. And another. Oh, it's the sleeping pills they're wearing off. William! Brace yourself, William. William. I've never seen her in such a state. I've been as quick as I can. What on earth is happening? Oh, come on, Christopher. There. There, darling. Quiet. It's all right. Shh. No, no, no. Shh. Don't pick up the baby. They'll all fly out. Oh. Oh, no. Look at them all, Dad. Goodness me. Goodness me. There. There, Christopher. Calm down now. The sleeping pill doesn't last forever. It always wears off by the next morning. They're too dopey to fly far. Look, they're all perching on the roof of the workshop. They nearly picked Christopher to pieces. Oh, well, look, take him into the caravan, Mrs. Clipstone. The, the birds are making him nervous. I should say they are. I had no idea they would all wake up like that. It was dreadful. You've no idea. Uh, uh, Danny. Uh, uh, push that pram into the workshop before a crowd gathers. Oh, here they all come. Watch out, Dad. A car's coming. And I think I know who it is. The big, shiny, silver Rolls Royce had braked suddenly and come to a stop alongside the filling station. Behind the wheel, I could see the enormous, pink, beery face of Mr Victor Hazel staring at the pheasants. I could see the mouth hanging open, the eyes bulging out of his head like toadstools, and the skin of his face turning from pink to bright scarlet. The car door opened, and he came at us like a charging bull. What the devil do you think you're doing with all my pheasants? Well, this is outrageous. I love you for this. This is daylight robbery. I demand my pheasants back now! But they're not your pheasants, they're mine. Don't lie to me, ma'am. I'm the only person round here who has pheasants. They're on my land. <laughs> they flew onto my land, and so long as they stay on my land, they belong to me. What? Don't you know the rules, you bloated old blue-faced baboon? What? How dare you? I'll... Well, you, 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 you wretched... Well, I'll have them back, you wait. But what's the matter with them, eh? What, what have you done to them? It's Sergeant Samway's dad. Well, 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 what may I ask is happening around here? I'll tell you what's happening round here. These are my pheasants, and this rogue has enticed them out of my woods into his filthy little filling station. Enticed? Enticed them, do you say? Of course he enticed them. Well, now. This is a very interesting hecutation, very interesting indeed, because I ain't never heard of nobody enticing a pheasant across six miles of fields and open countryside. How do you think this enticing was performed, Mr Hazel, if I may ask? Don't ask me how he did it, because I don't know. But he's done it all right. All my birds are sitting here in this dirty little filling station when they ought to be up in my own wood getting ready for the shoot. If I don't get these birds back on my land quick, sharp, 
some very important people are going to be extremely angry this morning. Oh, surely you know how these pheasants came here. Surely I do not know how they came here. It's quite simple. They all knew they were going to be shot today if they stayed in your wood, so they flew in here to wait until the shooting party was over. Rubbish! It's not rubbish at all. It is rubbish. They're extremely intelligent birds. Isn't that so, Doctor? Oh, they have tremendous brain power. You are scoundrels, both of you. You are rapscallions of the worst kind. No, then. Insults ain't going to get us nowhere. They only aggravate things. Now, I suggest that we all of us make a big effort to drive these birds back over the road onto Mr Hazel's land. How does that strike you, Mr Hazel? Well, it'll be a step in the right direction. Get on with it, then. How about you, Willem? Are you agreeable to this action? Well, I think it's a splendid idea. I'll be very glad to help. So will Danny. Right. Come on, me lads. Let's push these lazy birds over the road. Shoot! 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 Yeah, shoot. Off you go! Go on! Go on! Go on. Go on. Shoot! Shoot! Get on with you! Shoot! They don't go. seem to want to go far. They're coming down again. They're coming down on top of my beautiful car. No! No! Get off! Get off! Get off with you! Oh, not on my car! And it's scraping the paintwork! Send them over the road! We will! Yeah. We will! Over the road! Yeah, shoot! Go on! Shoot! Go on! Go on! Go on! Go on! Get him away! Get him off the car! Oh, they're ruining the car! Look, you madman! They're ruining my paintwork! Paintwork? What paintwork? We've done our best to encourage these birds over the road, but they're too ignorant to understand! Get them away from my car! Oh, your car! See what you mean, some beastly, dirty birds, pheasants are. But why don't you just hop in and drive her away fast? They'll have to get off then, won't they? Oh, right. All right, all right. Drive on, Mr. Hazel, sir. <coughs> hurry up, hurry up, get going quick. There's no time to lose. Ignore them pheasants, Mr. Hazel. Accelerate that engine. Look, Dad, the pheasants. They're staying up in the air. They're not flapping down. Great Scott, they've recovered. The sleeping pills have worn off at last. Yes, and all the others are waking up. Look at them all. They're off. They're going. But they're not flying back to Hazel's Wood, are they? No. They're heading in exactly the opposite direction. Oh, yeah. oh we've lost them, though. I knew we'd lost them just as soon as they started flying out of the pram. Oh, well, thank goodness that's all over. Oh, dear me, never seen such a shambles in my life. What a gathering. What a gathering of rogues and varmints. Good morning, Enoch. Morning, Mrs. Clipstone. Yeah, yeah, how's the baby? Better, thank you, William. Though I doubt he'll ever be quite the same again. Oh, of course he will. Babies are tough. I don't care how tough they are. How would you like it if you were being taken for a nice quiet walk in your pram on a pretty autumn morning and suddenly the mattress comes alive and starts bouncing you up and down like a stormy sea and then suddenly... Well, you... ladies and gents, I must be off. Oh, yeah, thanks very much for your help, you know. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it for all the tea in China, but it did sadden me to see all those lovely birds go slipping right through our fingers. <laughs> it's going to sadden the vicar a lot more than it saddens you. It's all he's been talking about ever since he got out of bed this morning. The lovely roast pheasant he's going to have for his dinner tonight. Now, now you come with me, Grace. I've got something to show you. Oh, all right, but I must be getting back. A great pity, Willem, because to my mind, there doesn't exist a more luscious dish than roasted pheasant anywhere on this earth. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Enoch. And Danny here has never eaten it. Good grief! Come and look at this! William! Enoch! Danny, come here! Laid out on my father's bench in the workshop were six magnificent pheasants, three cocks and three hens. We were speechless. Doc Spencer had had a hunch that some of the pheasants might have eaten more raisins than others. Some may have received a heavy overdose of sleeping pills and would never wake up. So, while we were all driving the birds onto Hazel's Rolls Royce, Doc sneaked into the workshop and took a look in the pram. And there they were. Amazing! Absolutely amazing! 
Those were the greedy ones. You see, it never pays to eat more than your fair share. So there's two for you, Willem. Oh, hi, Stock. <laughs> and two for Enoch. Oh, it's most generous, Doc. <laughs> and two for you, Mrs. Clipstone. Oh, how lovely. What about you, Doctor? Oh, my wife's got enough to do without plucking pheasants. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Who got them out of the wood in the first place? Eh? You, Danny, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was a famous victory. A was. famous victory. <laughs> now, come on, Grace, my dear, I'll drive you home. Oh, 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 oh my God. Oh, oh, so oh. happy. He's going to have to. It was all over now. My father and I stood alone just outside the workshop, and suddenly the old place seemed to become very quiet. Well, Danny, that's that. It was fun, Dad. <laughs> I know it was. I really loved it. I know a place about three miles away, over Cobbler's Hill and down the other side, where there's a small wood of large trees. It's a very quiet place, and the stream runs right through it. The stream? Mm. It's full of trout. Oh, could we? Oh, why not? We could try tickling them the way Doc Spencer told us. Oh, yes. Can we go now? Well, first we have to go to the village to buy that oven. Dad? Because with a bit of luck, we'll have lots more pheasants as the weeks go by. Could we ask Doc Spencer and Mrs Spencer to come and share our pheasants? That, Danny, is a truly wonderful idea. You are a genius! And when we've done that, we'll go off to the stream and see if we can't find us some big rainbow trout. I reached out and slid my hand into his, and we walked on towards the village in search of our new oven. And after that, we would walk home again and make up some sandwiches for our lunch. And after that, we would set off with the sandwiches, striding up Cobbler's Hill and down the other side to the small wood of larch trees with a stream running through it. And after that, perhaps a big rainbow trout. And after that, there would be something else after that. And after that, ah <laughs> yes, and something else again. Because what I'm trying to tell you, what I've been trying so hard to tell you all along, is simply that my father, without the slightest doubt, was the most marvellous and exciting father any boy ever had. A message to children who have listened to this story. When you grow up and have children of your own, do please remember something important. A stodgy parent is no fun at all. What a child wants and deserves is a parent who is sparky. Sparky!